to Esoterica. I am Leah Eichler, and today I have the distinct pleasure of interviewing uh, Brian Hanley. Brian is an American microbiologist. Uh, he is the founder of Butterfly Sciences, oh, sorry, Butterfly Sciences, it's a alliteration, uh, and he's known for um, self-experimenting with gene therapy to uh, extend human lifespan. Well, it's well, it twice. Oh, oh, okay. Well, yes. Okay, please. I um, is it Brian? Is it Doctor Hanley? You tell me. Um, Doctor Hanley is fine. Yeah. Let's do. Let's go with Doctor well, Hanley. Well, let's see. Um, you can do it either way. I don't. I don't really. Care. <laughs> you know what, Doctor Hanley? Because you have a there's a mad scientist vibe about you, so I'm I'm very comfortable with the doctor part. Um, but you know when okay. I when I start researching you and I came across the many different articles that are written about your journey, I, I mean it's it, it's almost the stuff of science fiction. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Dr. Hanley, and and have you tell us a little bit about your background and and how you came to butterfly sciences. Well, I have a pretty varied background. I I worked in the software industry for uh, uh, quite a while. Uh, did factory automation, uh, and then at a certain point, I I went back to grad school because I'd wanted to do. Uh, I'd originally almost double majored in cellular biology, but it was one of those things where I was I was going to school at night. After the first couple of years, I started working. It was kind of anticlimactic when I got my degree because I didn't have. Um, You know, I, I, I was already beyond, I was already advising, uh, you know, graduate school panels on what could be done and that sort of thing. Um, so I went back to school. I wanted to work on, on gene therapy and vaccines. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. I had a, I actually finished my grad school in less than three years, which is almost unheard of. I, when I saw that I was a bit yeah, I, it, was, it was quite the pinball machine experience. Yeah. Um, I actually had, I had one of the, one of the younger students who was so pissed off that he staged a protest at my, at my, you know, my, my final uh, orals, you know, where, where, where you talk about your project. Right. And, you know, people were kind of shocked when it's, you know, it's just, oh. You, know, you can't kick him out. He did, and as long as he was quiet. Sure. He has some time on his hands. So, I mean, so did you go back and complete your PhD, or go back for your your you know to further education because you were fascinated with uh, extreme long longevity? And I would love your definition of extreme longevity. That's part of it. Yes. Right. That was part of it. Um, you know, I also wanted to have. I wanted to try and have a legacy that was something a little more positive than what I was feeling I was doing. Right. Um, you know, I gotten I, I I have a couple of chapters in West Point books. You can uh, take a look at those in my my ARC ID if you want. Okay. Um, so I wanted to have something that was much more life positive. Right. And uh, you know, not so. Death oriented. I think, um, I mean, I think what, what's on everyone's mind is what is your gene therapy? And, and you've, you've well, self administered there are, it. Well, there are, um, let, let, let me sort of back up a little bit. Okay. There, there's different components to what's going on with aging. There's fundamentally, now, not everybody agrees with me on this, but this is mm -hmm. my, my view. Fun, there, there most basically, there is the genetic program. Mm -hmm. We have a lifespan, and there are genes that turn on and off as we get mm -hmm. older. Right. As you know, you, your body changes. Right. They happen, and they just happen, and there you are. <laughs> um, and there are genes that turn on and turn off to make us age and die. Right. And for species, death is very important. The, 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 because if you don't replace fast enough, 
and we see this now with megafauna in, mm -hmm. in uh, all over the world dying out. If the species doesn't reproduce fast enough, then it can't adapt to new to new things and changes. Mm -hmm. And so species tend to lengthen their lifespan up to the up to those limits. And if they go beyond those limits, then they die off. Like you know the rhinoceros, or, mm -hmm. or other you know uh, the big African lions and things like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas things like rats have short lifespans. So. Um, So there's that. And then for the individual, you have specific things like the, the Hayflick limit, which is how many times can a cell reproduce before mm -hmm. it stops? And there are two types of cells. You've heard of stem cells, mm -hmm. and then you have normal cells. Mm -hmm. And normal cells will only reproduce about 50 times. And then they stop, and they become senescent. So you run up against that limit. If, and that limit is there to help us live, actually, because you know what cancer is. Mm -hmm. Cancer is, in, in order for cancer to, to exist, you have to have uh, cells that reproduce without limit. Mm -hmm. And you know, by the time a person is 30 to 40 years old, Pretty much everybody has precancerous cells actually in their 20s, mm -hmm. uh, generally. And precancerous cells are cells that could become cancerous if they can get their telomerase going. And telomerase, mm -hmm. uh, it, telomerase maintains the ends of chromosomes, which get shorter and shorter and shorter. And if they get sh too short, then the chromosomes can't reproduce anymore properly. Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas with cancer cells, all of them keep the telomerase long, mm -hmm. and then they can go forever. Small an animals like mice can uh, ha have fibroblasts and certain kinds of cells that have active telomerase their whole lives, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why when you do certain kinds of mouse, te mouse testing, the results aren't exactly the same as they would be in people because the, amount, the number of cells you have in your hand is greater than a mouse has in his whole body. Mm -hmm. And so, and a mouse only lives a couple of years. So the number of cell years that that mouse has to develop cancer is a lot less. Right. So for them, it's better to be able to, to they, they essentially have fibroblast stem cells throughout their lives, throughout their bodies, they can heal better. Right. Um, the larger and longer lived mm -hmm an animal is, like elephants, the, the, the less, the more conservative they are with, with telomerase. Mm -hmm. And that's in order to, to prevent cancers from getting out of control. Um, so there's that. And uh, if we, the ability to regenerate like axolotls have, mm -hmm. um, also, um, Oh, uh, spiny! Oh, I forget their name right now. There, there, there's, there's a mammal that actually can re that can regenerate almost all of its organs and and tissues. Um, it's pretty unusual. You know, they can even regenerate their kidneys. That kind of capability is also something that could would potentially be useful for extending lifespan. Um, if you can put those together, then you could get to theoretically probably lifespans on the order of thousands of years. Right. And that, you know, that becomes very interesting to some people. Now there is a kicker here. We don't know how well our brains would handle that or if they would. Uh, because our because our, our the our the, the the nerve cells and glial cells the the nerve cells in our brains um, mostly they, they live for a very 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 long time most of our lifespan so you were going to say something 
No, I'm just, I, so I'm curious. Um, sorry, I'm going to be back here. So to bring it back to your research um, and your experimentation, um, what did you use and, and what it was the obje objective? And, and I mean, I know the research on, on the impact of your, your self-experimentation, I believe, came out last year. Maybe you could elaborate on that. December, on actually, a month ago. December, <laughs> right. So yeah, really, yeah. Yeah. Some... yeah, and that was really the result of about 10 years. So can you explain um, what you five did? Years of experiment, yeah. and then there was a, there was a lot of time and effort before that. Uh, you know, a great deal of it for me was you know if you're going to there's an old saying about how nothing quite concentrates the mind like knowing you're going to be hung in the morning. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and so, you know, I I I've used the metaphor that. What I do is translational work, mm -hmm. which means I take something that science has shown and then I, I turn it into a product, mm -hmm. which is kind of what you know, SpaceX does that for rocketry. You know, Goddard right. showed that rockets work way back in the 30s. Right. And it's taken this long to get us to be able to go up and then land them back on, on the ground without exploding most of the time. Right. So it's not, it, it, you know, it's a different problem, but you're the, you know, in this case, like I'm the rocket. I, I get it. Yeah. But it, I mean, in, in my mind, I'm, I'm having like Spider-Man kind of uh, vibes because uh, I'm trying to wrap my head around the, the genes that actually you injected or the, 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 yeah, the, the, this, this was a, it was a, um, a health span mm -hmm. treatment, meaning it was intended to. Um, um, it was intended to uh, improve my my health as I as 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 I get older, mm -hmm. so I'm stronger and and you know more vital, etc. Um, and that was a a, a GHRH uh, hormone, essentially creating a new gland. For that. Mm -hmm. There are. This is not. When you're when you're working in a field like this, and you're somewhat you know, you don't have a billion dollars, which I could right. use by the way. I could easily allocate a billion dollars to, to twenty right. projects. No doubt about and, it. Yeah, and yeah. and have a have a good portfolio. But when you you, you do what you can do, right. rather than what you what you know what you really really like to do, and so this was kind of a low hanging fruit that I could go after. Okay. And show something. Um, there are, right now, most of what, well, right now I would say all of what we have are what I would call hacks. Um, there are things that have been found that, for instance, there, there, there was, there's a um, uh, gene therapy that was shown in mouse model to extend their lives, if it if it if it if it worked for humans to the mm -hmm. same degree, it we would live for 150 to 160 years. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but it, for example, if you were a woman, you shouldn't go through menopause until you were over 100 years old. Wow, that would really change the game for the fertility industry. <laughs> it would. Now, whether you would remain fertile the whole time is another question. Right. We don't know. Um, we know that in the mouse, they did. Right. They they remained highly fertile. Um, but that's you know humans are somewhat different. Right. Can you uh, imagine how many babies people would have? I mean, they would well, have so many maybe, babies. Maybe not. If you know, if if you have, I mean, if, I'm sure. Yes, there are women who would want to have lots and lots and lots and lots of babies. <laughs> Okay. Because there are some women who just, that's what they want to do. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of women who are like, you know, oh, well, I, maybe I could wait until I was 80, you know. Right. Um, I would, you know, and maybe I, you know, I don't have quite the urgency, you know, that that biological clock going off when you're 30 to 35 is pretty, you know, it's pretty strong. It so, is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Men learn this. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Um, so yeah, so sorry. There's that, and then the, and then there's yeah. 
there is other treatments that would, um, well, for example, that one uh, would make would also make it so that without doing any training, you could just sit around, not do much, and you would be able to go out, and as long as your joints held up, you would be able to run a marathon, an ultra marathon, mm -hmm. no problem. Right. Your 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 physiology because because what 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 that treatment would do is it would change your your physiology so that you would be always essentially super trained. Mm -hmm. um, there is another one that would give you uh, excellent muscularity without having to do much for it. And a lot of people would probably like that. You wouldn't have to, you know, to the gym. you wouldn't have to go to the gym <laughs> if you didn't want to. Um, right. Although I'm, I rather imagine there would be people who would go to the gym to see how far they could get. Mm -hmm. Because that's, this is just how we are. Although most of those would be men. Right. <laughs> Um, although there are women who do too. Sure. So, so can you, uh, so you, you experiment on yourself. I just wanted yep. to, um, you experiment on yourself through, um, a technique that I, I would love you to explain because I'm not sure I a hundred percent understand it. And I'd love to know the results. Okay. Um, the, this particular method was to create a, a, a new, essentially a new gland actually to, um, one in each leg. I want it to be balanced just in case there was there was a, a little difference in how it worked and if it if it um, we weren't entirely sure if it would uh, signal if it would end up signaling locally for muscular development or not. It didn't, which is what we thought. But um, or I when I say we, it was it's me and you know people I I would talk to and sure. you know discuss this with. Um, who are not the designers of the experiment. It's important, it's, it's important that, that this be clearly understood. Okay. Um, and then we injected DNA mm -hmm. and you had two, two electrodes. Let's see. What, mm -hmm. So you have two electrodes and then you have the needle in between. Right. And you inject the bolus of the, of the DNA right between the electrodes. Pull the pull the pull the uh, the needle out, and then zap the electrodes with a hundred volts five times, a second apart. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and that and and the thing is, you see, DNA is an acid, deoxyribonucleic acid, which means it's charged. Mm -hmm. And that means that an electrical current will push it, will drive mm -hmm. it, and and at that scale. It drives it really hard, really fast, and it just it it basically goes flying right through the the the, the cell membranes. Okay. The cells. Um, and once inside the cytosol of cells, it will uh, it will go into the nucleus, mm -hmm. and because that the cells just just take DNA that looks like it belongs in the nucleus and just puts it there. Uh, there's there's native mechanisms for that. Um, and then it start it starts producing to, because you design it with it with a promoter that will uh, that will work in a in a human cell. And muscle cells have a high metabolic rate. And the promoter that uh, I hitchhiked on it's it was modified, but it's it's a it, it's a promoter that gets activated for production of myosin. Mm -hmm. which is the primary um, uh, muscle protein. So anytime the muscle is producing protein, it will signal to turn that, you know, turn that production on. And I felt a change within half an hour. I was okay. like, oh, something is happening. I was really surprised. I did Were you not scared? <laughs> I mean, I would be scared. I'm just curious. You know, it's kind of like if you're not scared, you're not paying attention. Right. Okay. You know, you really, you 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 should you should have a lot of respect for this. This is not right. something for people to do casually in their homes or whatever. You know, if, if they don't really understand it. Uh -huh. um, 
So yeah, I was. But at the same time, I, you know, I had done over four years of thinking and charting and studying and, and um, you know, I talked to another scientist shortly before I actually did this, a uh, woman named Rexandra, who was at that time, she was, she was, she was head of Europe's equivalent of NIH. Mm -hmm. um, she was very generous, you know, she, she's talked to me for over an hour um, and, you know, discussed the results she had with animals and that kind of thing. Um, so I was, you know, I was intellectually confident, mm -hmm. but, you know, I also, I partnered with a surgeon who, you know, part of our agreement was if it was necessary, he could take it out and he would know where it was. And I didn't want to do that, of course, but, you know, I trusted this guy. He's a very, he's, he's a really, you know, he's really good at what he does. Um, although he did get a little flustered right. because the first time we did it, we did it without anesthetic because I had read in, you know, in, um, there was a paper I found where they had, they had used this technique to, uh, drive genes into cancer cells. Mm -hmm. And they said that the patients were able to clearly differentiate each pulse. And that was the understatement of the century. <laughs> wow. Okay. Because what, ha what it felt like was it felt kind of like somebody's, well, the needles don't going in, they're very, very sharp. You, I didn't feel anything at all, and 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 um, and then when, but when when the, the the you know the surgeon pushed the button for the um, uh, at my direction for the uh, uh, the electroporation, my I mean it felt like I had a fork in my leg that was connected to a light socket, and somebody had turned on the juice was going. Uh -huh. Flip, 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 and my leg went flying up in the air. Wow! And it flustered him so much that <laughs> you know he hit the button again, thinking it was the it would turn it off when it turned for another cycle. So I ended up grabbing the the thing and pulling pulling it all out of my leg, which wow. was and and then you know we spent a few minutes and he goes, "Are you really ready to do this again?" And I get, yeah, we'll do it again. He goes, better man than me. Wow. <laughs> so and you so said he good. felt something 30 minutes after. I mean, now that it's been a few years, I mean, what did, what, well, what did you discover? And, and the, 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 first, the first month was extraordinary. It was like, I, I felt like I was a teenager again. Mm -hmm. And I began to realize, oh, my God, a lot of what I think of as maturity is just hormones kind of like settling down a bit, you know? Right. Um, <laughs> right. You have teenagers. I, I do. Yeah. You, do. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, they, they, they have this combination of like crankiness and and being able to do anything right. and being completely, you know, and so I would, I, I felt like, I mean, I really, I was, I just felt like I just kind of want to lay around. But at the same time, I had all kinds of energy and I felt fantastic. You know, I just mm -hmm. felt that, you know, that just, you know, we're, but, you know, teenagers don't appreciate that because they don't have anything to compare it to. And so they're like, you know, they're like cranky about how they feel all the time and, oh, man, you know, all that. And I started feeling that. Wow, this is really interesting. And, um, and it kept, for the first few weeks, it kept escalating to the point where I, 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 I decided if this keeps going, I'm going to have to take him to ask him to take this out because it was start, I mean, it was getting to the point where it was starting to interfere with my ability to, well, not other my ability to do things, but with my willingness to be interested in, in doing things, you know, right. um, feeling just so fantastic. And at, at one point I was, I was, I was riding up a mountain on a mountain bike with, with a, a, a woman friend 
who I hadn't told anything about it, although later she said, I knew something was going on. I knew it. <laughs> you just weren't telling me. And um, she was going slow, and I start, I got going so slow next to her that I started to lean over on my bicycle, and I was feeling so good, I just, like, didn't do anything. Of course, normally I would have corrected, you know. And so I just went over. And she was like, what? Because, you know, I never do that. And she was just like, right. you know. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, and, and, but then it started to tail off. And my, my, what I, what, how I, how I think of that are, is there were two things going on. One is, you know, things kind of settled out a bit because initially with, 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 most it was a it was a semi-synthetic promoter so it wasn't a full-on synthetic and the, yeah. the, the pattern tends to be you get a really sharp spike in the beginning and then you go and then it goes down and it tails off well this one had this really sharp spike and then it kind of went down and then it and then it kept going at a pretty good level for quite a long time i've got mm -hmm. the graphs of that i didn't prepare them to share with you guys unfortunately it's okay um, it's but uh so so there was so there was that but then the other part of it was you know however you feel you just started you just kind of you adjust to it and it's like oh that's that's normal now and so you yeah there just comes your norm and you just kind of like oh okay you know like when you're younger you're just like oh okay you know and you don't feel like you're feeling fantastic but relative to what you might in some later time you, mm -hmm. you do so I mean, it's fascinating. So I want to make a slight segue. Um, it's irritating. Um, we talked about longevity, and obviously, you're putting a lot into the research of longevity. But that needs that story needs to be told in cahoots with the environment, which you've touched on before. So yes. as much as we have these aspirations or perhaps your company and some technology aspirations to extend human lifespan, there is this um, environmental uh, Armageddon, for lack of a better word, that we're facing that may have different, uh, there may be a different plan, actually. And I know you've done a lot of research on uh, environmental issues and the climate, and I just wanted you to touch on that as well. Yeah, I've got, I, I, I have a, one of those cross-domain skill sets. Mm -hmm. And so I got pulled into this thing. There's a, unfortunately, the letter, as I understand it, was accepted like last, early this week or late last week um, for proceedings on National Academy of Sciences. And it's a critical letter. Mm -hmm. and, and basically, the core of it is the climate science is much, it, the climate science is really pretty dire. Um, at, but the economics uh, profession has wildly misconstrued and misinterpreted um, some of it so much so that I tend to, to, I tend to think it's probably deliberate. Mm -hmm. They use they they use methods for for deciding what damages are, economic damages will be that are absolutely farcical. Um, have nothing to do with with any sort of reasonable reality. Mm -hmm. And if you you know if you've been following things you know the we're seeing more and more extreme weather events. Mm -hmm. you know? Seeing, you know, we, right. we're, we're seeing a ramp up. Like yeah. And, and, you know, this year we had a satellite detection of ground temperatures on the edge of the Arctic Ocean in Siberia of 114 degrees. And what that means is we're getting um, methane release and CO2 release mm -hmm. from the permafrost where it's been locked for. Mm -hmm thousands and thousands of years. That pulse of heat is going down. And, we, and if you look at, um, you, you can Google it, 
Um, mm. There are craters that have explode, been exploding in Siberia. There's at least 17 of, of them with continuous emission of methane. And some of them have flames uh, involved. And, 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 and that pulse of methane is going into the atmosphere and we're, and we're just putting up satellites to be able to try to track that. So mm -hmm. we really don't have a handle on what that is. And methane is um, a considerably stronger greenhouse gas than CO2, although it doesn't last as long. Right. And it, it, its lifespan should be on the order of, of a few hundred years. But there are archaeological records that show that if for, in the Eocene, there were, there were long-term emissions of, of, um, of methane from the, from the ocean, mm -hmm. from the floor. And one of, the, one of the sources of that is methane clathrates. Methane clathrates, methane together with water, particularly under pressure, will form an ice, what looks like ice, it's white and it's hard. It's hard. Uh, and this also forms under the permafrost. When either the pressure is released or the temperature rises, the methane, it, it essentially kind of starts melting and sublimating. Mm -hmm. And we've had, we started, there have been reports of refrigerator sized blocks of fizzing, fizzing ice coming up from the seafloor as early as, as the, the mid 90s. Mm -hmm. um, in the in the in the near continental shelf so that suggests that there's been some some degree of warming and so as the heat pulse goes down in the ocean which can take thousands of years you we should see a a relatively continuous emission of methane so we've got we've got that issue um we have to do something about this and the unfortunately the people who are saying that they believe this the climate science are not believing the scientists about what the solution is relative to energy mm -hmm. and there's an interesting there, there's a paper from 2011 by a guy named tim garrett who's actually an atmospheric uh, uh, scientist physicist if i remember correctly and he found that there was a lockstep uh, correlation between the amount of energy we consume and the amount of money we have. So our money creation system essentially for, for over half a century was, was 9.7 uh, milliwatts plus minus 0.2 milliwatts per dollar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's an extraordinary result that you know, econ economics should really pay attention to, but they're not. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that means is that if you if you say, okay, let's just cut the amount of energy we use in half, what you're saying is we're going to create poverty, serious poverty for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to work. And it's not, it's, you know, it's not really fair. Um, the other thing is that the, the, the use of solar and wind, it's a very low energy yield for the amount of energy you put into it. Mm -hmm. number one. Um, fossil fuels on the or are, there, are on the order of, of 40 to 40 to 50 times, whereas they're on the order of between two and 10 times mm -hmm. maximum. <clears throat> and they're intermittent, so they, they lock in the use of fossil fuels uh, to produce the difference and to stabilize the grid because a grid has to supply exactly the amount of energy demanded right it's required rather than the other way around you can't push energy through a grid right and, and say okay use this when we want you to um it just doesn't work that way so you know that solution doesn't work and one of the other things i, I, I this this was a number of years ago i wrote a book on treatment of, of um, radiation exposure and in humans and explaining the mechanisms how radiation uh, 
you know, damage works, which is very mm -hmm. similar, similar to the way UV damage works in the skin. <clears throat> and we have repair, repair mechanisms, et cetera. And, um, you know, the bottom line of that, I, I, I ended up writing chapters on nuclear power and nuclear accidents and things, because that was what people wrote to me saying, well, this is what I'm worried about. Um, you know, I, I had one woman write me because her her friends had told her that she needed to make out her will because she'd had a CAT scan. And right, you know, right. so I told her, well, you know, that's kind of an exaggeration. No, you, you don't need to do to go that far. Uh, and there's there's you know, the, the epidemiology is that there's no evidence except in the youngest of children that there's any signal for for, you know, for cancer from that. Um, we're a lot we're a lot stronger and tougher than we think right so um you know the, the bottom line here is that we can do this with uh with nuclear power mm -hmm. nuclear power has has a a theoretical power factor of around 78 million as opposed mm -hmm. to 46 for fossil fuels which means and we have um uh, there's enough uranium in the oceans, if we har harvested a quarter of it, to last 100,000 years at very high rates of, of, of utilization. Um, you know, there's a lot more we could say about this if you wanted to have a conversation just about this. And right, I don't know I how imagine. we're doing for time. Yeah, I, I, we should probably wrap it up. I, I just would like uh, to hear from your perspective. Um, and I, I mean, I, I appreciate that you have some solutions, so it's not all dire um and from an environmental perspective but where um how do you mesh the two ideas of, of longevity with and with the climate with the art artists and climate issues i mean should there even be an attempt to increase our longevity if the earth is really telling us otherwise well I don't know if the Earth is really so much telling us otherwise as we are telling ourselves otherwise. <laughs> so we're telling ourselves otherwise we're, yeah we're we're, we're you know, we're, we're being irresponsible. And right. there's very specific people who are being wildly irresponsible. You know, you know, people like the Cox, the, the, the you know, the, and um, I think that's how you pronounce it, the K-O-C-H brothers, you know. The, right, oh, the co yeah, I think that's it, yes. The, the Rockefellers have been attacking nuclear power with, with, with gaming for, you know, since the 40s. Right. They recognize it as a threat, the, the, um, uh, you know, the source of, of money for to fund the takeover of the Sierra Club and turn it anti-nuclear was uh, Standard Oil. You know, uh, Mark Z. Jacobson, who wrote those those papers, wrote that paper that said we can do this with we can do 100 percent solar and wind. I mean, it, it's a farcical paper. It's just not it, it's been torn apart. It's been torn right. to shreds. He has never gotten any money except from oil from oil sources mm -hmm. and you know, people don't realize this. Uh, so, uh, and, 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 and at this point, what we need to do is we need to, you know, we need to convert over to nuclear on a wartime schedule and just mm -hmm. do it whole hog. We need, we need about three times the amount of energy that we're, we're generating now from electricity because we need to switch over our transport. And then we're gonna need to have enough energy to compensate for, for the, um, for, you know, for the temperatures we're going to get, because right. we're going to see an increase in temperature. The question is, where we, where can we get it to let kind of level off? Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we'll have threats to agriculture. We're going to need a huge amount of energy to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And we can, we can. It's not, you know, it's not impossible. I mean, um, anyway. So relative to longevity, um, right. I'm kind of an, I, uh, an unusual person in this field because unlike many, my, my, you know, no matter what happens, we're going to die. True. We're going to die yeah. of accidents. We're going to die of thermodynamics. I mean, you can, in, in a sense, all of us have already died. You know, we, we are not the people we were 20 years ago, or if you're old enough, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. you might, you, uh, you, if you met yourself back then, you'd probably have a few things to say. 
Yes, I see that look on your face. <laughs> I would. <laughs> I, would. I, had a, I had a real talk with myself, actually. Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, 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 so that, and um, the positive I would say is that it gives you a, a direct stake in the future rather than an indirect one. Right. And um, there's, you know, there, there, there's, a, there's a lot of, of, well, let me put it this way. Mm-hmm. I have been at billionaires' parties. You know, I got invited because, you know, token scientist, you know. <laughs> invite, the, invite these scientists. And, you know, and I'm, reasonably, I'm reasonably sociable. You know, I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not a total Sheldon. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I, and I'm not going to sit, sit on, sit in the salad or anything like that. Right. <laughs> I'm doing anything really straight. So, you know, I rubbed shoulders with some of these, you know, these oil guys who are, you know, who are in their 60s, 70s. And I can tell you, they don't give a rat's ass about right. anything, but keeping the money rolling in right. and having pretty girls on their own. Right. That they, that they can, you know, they have enough money to be able to have them. And mm-hmm. they want to keep that happening. Um, it's not a pretty picture, but this is, this is, our, this is our reality. And we, we have to, we have to stand up and, and say something about it and do something about it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. Well, this has been hugely eye-opening for me, and um, and I'm, I'm hoping you come back and we can talk more about climate and other issues, and maybe how these oil men should invest that billion dollars because they want to live forever. So you know, maybe that's the maybe that's the key. But um, I, I'm so grateful for your time. Thank you so much. Sure, I'd be happy to come back. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>